What we want to do is to promote resiliency in our children, and one way of doing that is to promote the social and emotional well-being of infants and toddlers. Because it's critically important that we do so, because that forms the basis of mental health as an adult. It can also plant the seeds for mental illness if we do not meet children's needs when they're young. It also determines the capacity to learn because the way the brain gets wired depends on one's experiences. When you are in a safe environment, a nurturing environment, a stimulating environment, your brain grows in a way that enhances your capacity. But when your body is focused on whether you have enough to eat, whether you are safe, whether you are stressed, the brain doesn't grow because of the stress that the body has experienced. And it changes the cognitive outcomes for that child, potentially for life. But we have the ability within existing systems to do the things that need to be done even when children have experienced toxic stress to change outcomes for children. But it does require us to be very focused on our children and very uh, well informed on what it is they need and how to access what they need. It's also important to understand that these early years determine whether we as adults can form and maintain healthy relationships. It's that important to the rest of these children's lives. When we, in Georgia, made babies and children parties to the cases, it certainly helped us to be able to focus on the children because children come to court. It's important for us as judges to see those babies. I have the opportunity to hold the babies, and it's very important because you want to be able to see are they making eye contact? Are they, what's their muscle tone? Are they responsive? Because you know how much trouble a child is in within the first few minutes of even holding a baby. I want to give you some examples about impact because my job is to talk about impact and how the impact of not meeting infant mental health needs moves us to the point of children um, ending up in the juvenile justice and then as adults in the criminal justice system. Well, what we see in, in terms of uh, our children has a lot to do with how they're raised. I have a young teenage mother who's in foster care come in with her baby. And I ask her to come up so I can see the baby. It's very important for me to support her as a parent, encourage her as a parent. So I ask her, talk to your baby. No response. I ask her a second time, talk to your baby. No response. Third time I say, I've asked you to talk to your baby and, and I don't understand. And she looks at me with tears in her eyes and she says, I don't know how. So I took the baby from her and I turned the baby around and I talked to the baby and got the baby smiling and cooing and the things that you think every parent does but not when your mother's an alcoholic. And she had been raised where there wasn't that nurturing, there wasn't that engagement. And even though she loved this child, and she was a very good parent to this child, she had no idea how to engage this child. So that became our job as the adults, to teach her what she didn't learn from her mother. And parenting is hard, and we can't assume that our parents know that they are meeting the social and emotional needs of our children. What we do know is what distracts parents and keeps parents from doing the engagement. We have very serious issues with maternal health. Um, the evidence about postpartum is very clear. There will be many, many mothers who give birth who will experience postpartum. And when postpartum is untreated, it manifests as more serious depression and can manifest as bipolar disorder. And it impacts their ability to care for themselves and to care for their children. We also know that we have enormous issues with substance use. We have very serious issues with domestic violence. And we have new challenges of technology because our young parents are not engaging with their children, they're engaged with their phones and with each other on social media. 
Um, and that is problematic for our children because children need time, they need attention, they need focus. When children don't get their basic needs met and they don't have the cognitive development that we see, then they don't develop the words that they need when they begin the process of education. And education is extremely important in those early years. It's also important for us to think about cultural competency as well. When we have children that are raised in a non-English speaking family, and for whatever reason they can't remain there and we have to place them with another family, but that family doesn't have the language or the culture, that's a huge disadvantage for that child because we really want our children to be bilingual and we want to make sure that we're doing the culturally competent things and making certain that we are supporting them in knowing the language and the culture of their families. So I think that is something that we have to think about as part of social and emotional health is keeping them connected to what their language is, what their culture is. But children that don't have words, when the time comes for them to go to school, they're already very, very far behind. And what happens is that if you don't have words to express how you feel, then what ha you do, what you comes naturally if you're frustrated, you act out. And children who act out are put out of their foster care placements because they're too hard to handle. They're put out of their um, child care facilities because they are aggressive and disruptive. They're put out of pre-K. They're put out of kindergarten. And yes, we did address that with Representative Nick's bills to make certain that we're dealing with kindergarten through third grade, but we've done nothing to address the child care and pre-K settings to make certain that children who are having dysregulation receive the services they need because that dysregulation is a sign that they have not had their social emotional needs met. I will give you the example of a call that I received from law enforcement asking me to detain a kindergartner. The kindergartner was running across the desk and kicking children in the face and was completely out of control. And of course, the school resource officer calls the judge. And I'm like, I uh, know we can't detain children in kindergarten, but we can provide services. Please send over the child, the parent, the school social worker, and let us address what's happening with this child. Well, the underlying issue was this child was extreme domestic violence. And that was why he was physically aggressive in the school system. And so it's very important for us, instead of saying to children, why do you act this way? We have to say to our children, what has happened to you? What is it that you are trying to tell me through your behaviors? Because as uh, our previous presenter said, behavior is their language and it does mean something. So it is extremely important for us as the adults to focus on that. Once children are put out of school because of their behavior, whether it's in school suspension or out of school suspension, they get further and further behind. Now keep in mind, that part of their disruption of school is their lack of knowledge. And then when we keep them out of school more because of their behavior, we have only increased their lack of skill in education. So the further and further they get behind, the less ability they have to get the education they need. But the children who need the most education and who will benefit the most from the education are the ones who are not receiving it the ones who are having this behavior dysregulation. So the question becomes, how do we identify in early stages and provide the appropriate services to enhance the educational experience instead of removing them from the educational experience? And part of that is expanding the services that we provide in the early years. Traditionally in Georgia, we've taken the stance that children under seven don't receive mental health services. But if you look throughout the nation, that is not common practice elsewhere. We recognize that there is capacity and need 
to strengthen relationships between caretakers and children so that you can coach the caretakers on how to teach that child self-regulation and change that child's behavior, change that child's trajectory. What was referenced earlier um, in the Voices presentation is a local initiative done by the Douglas County Board of Commissioners because we have no workforce to serve children under the age of seven. A grant was received from the Board of Commissioners to the court. We contracted with uh, LSU to provide training to 28 clinicians to do child parent psychotherapy. And that is 26 intensive sessions over the course of a year where the therapist works with the child and the parent gives them feedback on identifying what the behaviors mean, how to shape those behaviors, how to interact with that child, and how to be able to promote self-regulation of that child. And it changes the lives of the caretaker and it changes the lives of the children in a very positive way. It's important that we pay attention to red flags. Uh, and as I've pointed out to you, those can be disrupted foster care, being put out of daycare, and being suspended out of school. Those are red flags that social and emotional needs and health of children is not being addressed. <coughs> the risk that we take as children are out of school and they're more and more out of school because they're behind is that they learn to, when they hit middle school, the adults become less important in their lives and their peers become more important. They do not want their peers to know that they can't read. They don't want their peers to know that they have trouble with math. It's easier to be the class clown. It's easier to be disruptive and be put out of the class than to be identified as having a disability. So you will see um, those children being more and more out of school, more associated with negative peers because they're all out of school together. And what you will see in terms of their behavior is things like they will smoke. Now we call it vaping, which is very dangerous, as we know. Um, use of marijuana, experimental uh, use of alcohol. We'll see property crimes and we'll see vandalism. But we also see early sexuality because they're out of school and they're engaging in sexual conduct and that leads to early parenthood and basically generational, um, as we saw in the video, uh, based upon my having seen this young child where she was initially uh, the, the basis of the video, this young woman was initially traumatized as a molestation by a neighbor, and then I would see her being truant, and then I would see her as a substance using teen, and then I would see her as the mother of four children. And the problem is that she got very little education, had just struggled mightily, so any kind of treatment for her that was based upon um, group work and things of that sort was very difficult for her uh, because she didn't have the educational foundation. And she also knew very little about parenting. Her solution to having a small car and four children was to transport two of the children in the trunk. And she didn't understand that that was certainly not even remotely acceptable. So it's important for us to do what we need to do in terms of recognizing where the red flags are so that we are getting them services. Um, we also have issues that occur when our young people are out of school. They don't belong because they don't have the education and the abilities that their peers have, and they are drawn to the negative peers and ultimately can be drawn into the gangs. Because gangs give you a family, it gives you a sense of belonging, and it gives you power that you may lack if you have not been successful in our traditional educational systems. I also want to uh, follow up with what uh, was said about suicide. Unfortunately, since our, we are in the process of reviewing uh, child fatality review, uh, our suicides now have been as young as the age of seven. And it is extremely important for us to understand that when a child has social and emotional <coughs> well-being and social and emotional mental health, we have created a circle of safety for that child because they're connected to a variety of adults. When we're seeing suicide in very young children, 
This is part of our signs of isolation and them not having the ability to know who or how to reach out. So that is a very serious problem in Georgia, and it's a very serious problem across all ages. But the last five years has been the first time that we have seen it in preteens and now in very young children. So we have to be cognizant of how important that is. We also see differences in girls and boys uh, that impact what happens with social emotional health. With girls, there's more internalization, more depression, more substance use. With boys, there's more acting out, more physical behaviors. Um, you also will see with girls, and sometimes with boys as well, cutting. And those are indicators of the absence of social emotional health. So, what ultimately happens in the court system is I will have a third of my caseload, which is the infants and toddlers, primarily around substance abuse and mental health. <coughs> but a third of my caseload is teenagers. And those teenagers are where the parents have reached the point that they cannot manage the mental illness issues with those children. They cannot manage the behavior, the aggressive behavior. I actually did an intake call on my way in this morning for this committee. And unfortunately, it's a disrupted adoption. This is a child who in adolescence is physically aggressive, is suicidal, and the adoptive mother is to the point that she feels the need she has to protect the other children in the home, and she is refusing to pick him up at the hospital this morning. So it's vital that we provide the basis for mental health at the earliest point that we can. And any time that we're seeing these red flags, that we immediately focus on social and emotional health because the brain does have the plasticity to change by positive experiences and the interventions that we can do. I can tell you that in 30 years of doing this work, we can't focus solely on children. We have to focus on their parents and their caregivers because it is a family unit. And when you talk about uh, maternal health, you have to talk about safe pregnancies. Many of our children who are experiencing dysregulation have substance use exposure. We have very few experts that can guide us on what to do. The waiting list for the Emory Neurodevelopmental Clinic takes eight to 12 months to get a child evaluated. The wait at the Marcus Center on autism can be one or two years. So our lack of professional expertise when we know we have acute needs hampers us in being able to provide what needs to happen. Our children need consistent medical care. One of the enormous red flags for our children in birth to three is not getting their well checks. And our information systems are not shared and it is very difficult for us to know whether children are getting the appropriate care because there's not this integrated information sharing system. Children need safe and stable nurturing environments. They need structure. They need consistency. And those are what allow us to teach our children self-regulation. And self-regulation becomes the foundation for adulthood. Can they follow rules? Can they be employed? Can they follow the law? Can they have a healthy relationship with appropriate boundaries? We do not have case management across agencies to deal with infants and toddlers. One of the key issues is that we put children in foster care, we make the referral to Children's First, but before the Children's First evaluation is completed, if there's a change in address, public health doesn't get that change of address, and there's no shared information between the Division of Family and Children's Services and public health to assure that those children are actually evaluated. What happens is there's a checklist. I made the referral, my job is done. Public health sends out one letter, one call. Well, if the child's no longer there, they check off that they've done their job. 
But that baby's can't wait piece is the essential piece of where our early services are. Babies Can't Wait provides a wide variety and high quality, excellent services to our children, birth to three. And when they hit the 30 month mark, we have to begin the application to move their services from public health to the education system. But the education system calls, is called in early special education has a different name in every county. In my county, it's LEAP. In Carroll County, it's PALS. And federally referred to it as the local education agency. You're supposed to send in your application to the LEA. Parents don't understand that. And I think there's a lot we can do to make certain that we have continuity of care. Um, another thing that's a huge barrier for us is lapses in Medicaid. Medicaid has to uh, require documentation from time to time. We're using physical addresses. Our families don't stay there, and they don't renew, and we have large gaps. It takes a long time for us to be able to get the children back on Medicaid, and we really, really struggle to have that continuity of care. Um, we have the opportunity under the Family First Prevention Services Act to begin to serve family and children uh, when they are candidates for foster care, and that will be year after next, 2021. And it's important when you're looking at Medicaid to consider the value of having coverage for the mother after the birth of the child so that we can follow what is considered best practices. Best practices for social and emotional mental health of infants and toddlers is to keep families together. If there are substance use and mental health problems, if we can support them together in treatment, then <coughs> we are following what is considered best practices to get the best possible outcomes for our children. Uh, so there's great value in looking at what Alabama's doing. There's great value in looking at what Tennessee is doing. We have a lot of things here. We need a lot more coordination of services, a lot more shared information, and a lot more case management. But we have to build capacity of workforce, and that is not just in child welfare, but that is also in education, and that is very much so in the mental health field. Zero to three says it's all about relationships, and what I teach people is same places, same faces. If you are constantly changing your caregiver, you're not going to do well. If you are constantly changing your therapist, you're not going to do well. If you are constantly changing schools and educational settings, you're not going to do well. And if you're constantly changing your daycare provider, your medical provider, you're not going to do well. And with our children, we take them anywhere to anybody that will see them and we don't think about the need for same places and same faces. Thank you for the opportunity to share what I've learned in 30 years. I look forward to working with you throughout this process because this is vital work. Thank you. You've given us a lot and a little bit of time, I know. And I know particularly um, always, even though I'm very engaged in suicide, and that conversation and the prevention, when you hear it get younger and younger and younger, and probably there have been attempts even younger than we're aware of for some very little person to very intentionally give up. The good and, news is that we have the surveys in the schools, mm -hmm. and we ask them about suicide attempts, so we know where to focus our uh, interventions, at least with school-age children. But our safety nets for our younger children are their well checks and the opportunity for them to have uh, the services through uh, daycare and through Children's First and Babies Can't Wait. One of the things nationally that my grant people keep asking me is, where's your home visitation program for high-risk pregnancies, for high-risk births? And I'm like, well, we have some in some remote areas of rural Georgia where there's not a lot of health services. We have none in metro 
area and I don't have any access to home visitation programs. And that's what my national uh, reviewers are asking me. Why do you not have that here in Georgia? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Chairman Dickey. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, I appreciate you coming here today. I, I really, uh, what a challenging uh, scenario you've really painted here. And I'm just really blown away by all you've ta um, talked to us about here this morning. I really appreciate the, the job you do and uh, really give me a lot to think about. I tell you, it really, I, I don't see firsthand what you see on a day-to-day -day basis. And it's just really, um, really, really touched me. Uh, this morning, um, but I've got a couple of uh, questions to, to, to kind of that come to mind that I've seen, and, and the, I've seen figures where uh, the number of children put in foster care has just dramatically increased over the last few years in our state. Yes, is that been positive? Is that help? Is that is that a good trend? I mean, not a good trend, but is that a good? Um, um, way to treat um, or to help these children? No, it's not a good trend, but it's consistent with the national trend. Yeah. And it's consistent with what you look, when you look at the cost of living and you look at wages and you look at the people who are at risk, it's consistent with what we're experiencing. We're going to see more and more issues around housing. Affordable housing for our families that don't make very much money is one of the greatest challenges that we face. It's not uncommon for me to deal with children living in cars. I did no. intake on children living in cars this week uh, because the family finally got to the point where they just couldn't provide for the children. They were very candid that they were, they were worn out. They didn't have anywhere else to go. So no, that's not a good trend. But we're get, we, for the first time, we are shifting child welfare reform, uh, child welfare financing. We are going to be able to serve families where we know they're at risk for being removed, foster care. So we are going to shift our work more into family preservation so that we will be able to reduce those numbers. And we're working very hard uh, looking at other models of things that we can do to reduce those numbers. Because the best family for a child is the birth family <laughs> if it can be a safe family, right. a stable family that can meet the well-being of that child. Um, may I ask another question? Uh, another, and I thank you, thank you for the, these recommendations. I, I know Sarah's getting them, in, and I really appreciate the specifics recommendations uh, that you've given us some here, and I, I hope you'll make sure we, we have all that you, that you want. The other issue that comes to mind is the is a um, mental health professionals the, the, really the lack of them? Uh, yes. I, I hear that, and in, in, in when I'm doing K through 12 funding and and all through, we, we just don't have the. You mentioned the capacity of, of mental health professionals to, to, to provide treatment. Um, why do you think? Can you shed light on why we don't have that? Is it is it licensing it's, problems, education, and what's the? How can we? Fix that. I expect that Erica has a better handle on that, but my perception is that we don't value it, we don't pay, uh, we don't uh, provide any incentives for people to be in that field, and I don't think that it draws the respect that it should uh, because it's vital. It's vital mm -hmm. to all of us. It is. But I think Erica's probably in a better position to be give you a better answer on workforce. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Representative Oliver. I want to agree with uh, Chairman Dickey about how overwhelming this is. Even though I have a little bit of exposure to these issues, I've, in the beginning of my law practice, had to represent parents who were living in cars. And in the last month, I've had multiple parents talk to me about, in my law practice, their worry about self harm of their children. So I have a tiny bit of exposure, but what my ignorance is that I'm revealing to myself today, this complexity, is drilling down into the specifics of who gets paid for what. Mm -hmm. And um, Madam Chair, I think that might be, as we go forward, very, very helpful. 
who has the power to change the diagnostic codes that will result in Medicaid funding for children at what age? What's that procedure? Uh, who analyzes how it costs? I mean, if is the is Governor Kemp in empowered today to say I want to cover children under seven for mental for Medicaid mental health services, and he just says it, and that happens, or? Your local expert is Ariane Weldon, and I certainly would consider having Ariane talk to you a little bit about the Medicaid codes. Diane, Danielle Navinger uh, with Amerigroup is another one that has uh, expertise on the codes <laughs> and, and what it takes to be able to change those. But yes, we, we can make those adjustments, and it is within community health. And Babies Can't Wait, is that an entitlement program where everything's paid for by Medicaid, or is it paid for by other some? Madam Babies. Chair, we don't have to, she doesn't have to answer me now because I know our time, but I need to understand all that. A lot of to, Babies Can't Wait is actually federal funding that's drawn down, but some of it is also state funding, some of it is Medicaid billable. It just depends on what the services are. It's compl complicated, There's and I realize I don't understand it. There's not anything in dealing with infants and toddlers that's straightforward or easy. I think Dr. Sitkoff may have oral information on that, too. If you would just go to that microphone over at the podium, though, just so that it's really picked up um, so that we get that information. And we are going to focus on this again in another one of our sessions a little bit later. I would just echo what Judge Walker said, but Department of Community Health does have the ability to um, encourage the managed care organizations to allow use of those diagnostic codes in order to submit for reimbursement. Um, and then as regarding the babies can't wait, there is federal money that comes in, but the first payer of that is the child's insurer. So Medicaid, their private insurance, it goes first to them to fund it, and then it goes, gets over to the program. Very, very good question too. We'll I think we're seeing that without a doubt, so we'll make sure that we explore that a little more moving forward. Okay. Any other questions or comments from the committee or from Judge Walker? Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you for what you do every single day. You're making a huge difference, and we hope we can help you. <laughs>